Hello and welcome to the Peace Talk, this time with Hannes Meissner. Hannes Meissner is a senior researcher in the Competence Center for Black Sea Region Studies. In 2012, Meissner was rewarded a PhD in political science with the distinction uh, magna cum laude uh, by the University of Hamburg. Um, his uh, research focuses on informal aspects of rule, post-Soviet transition processes, and last but not least, the resource curse. Uh, Meissner took also part in the research program um, Violence and Security of the German Institute of Global and Area Studies, short EGA. Um, besides his role in the earlier mentioned content center, Meissner gives lectures and seminars at the University of Vienna, Konrad Adenauer Foundation, and the Austrian uh, Oriental uh, Society. So I'm very glad that you found the time um, to talk to our audience um, of the Wanner Institute for Peace Research. Thank you very much. Yeah, thank you for the invitation. Uh, to talk about having you to have the opportunity to talk about the resource curse, which is an actual and uh, widespread problem around the world. Um, today we will talk, um, as you mentioned, about the resource curse and also about uh, concepts and theories like state capture, um, rentier states, and uh, and about your experience uh, and knowledge of the Caspian region. So let me begin with my first question. Mm, what does the resource curse theory uh, actually try to explain? Well, um, the term resource curse uh, is actually uh, a term that refers to a wide set of theories and causalities explaining the negative consequences of resource abundance, huge resource incomes countries generate from the export from natural resources such as oil, gas, mineral stones, gemstones um, um, and all about this, this export or the, those neg uh, incomes they, these countries generate, they lead to negative consequences actually and, and there's a wide range of negative consequences, it's um, potential negative consequences, it, it's important to stress that, it, that there's a potential of negative consequences, it's, it's not an automatic uh, um, Causality is there also some countries that really benefit from natural resource incomes, you know, Norway, Australia, the United States in the past. But actually, most states in the world that do not really or do not at all uh, benefit from natural resource abundance because um, they, these countries' negative consequences occur. And those negative consequences occur in different fields. So it's really the term refers to a wide uh, area wide field of negative consequences. Firstly, uh, natural resource abundance is often uh, associated with uh, authoritarian rule. So there are causalities explaining the ways uh, natural resource income strengthen authoritarian rule. That's firstly. Secondly, natural resource incomes are often associated with economic distortions or socioeconomic grievances and um, which is a paradox because uh, on one hand those countries were really rich in natural resources they have the natural uh, the, 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 the incomes in order to generate theoretically generate uh, welfare for everybody or at least a huge part of the population but in fact those countries they, they show socioeconomic grievances and this is a paradox of plenty so that uh, mm -hmm. um, to also related to the resource curse. Um, yeah, thirdly, and this again is quite a popular view that natural resource abundance is associated with conflict and war. So it's, it's a popular term, you know, resource wars, uh, resource conflicts, uh, other terms like blood diamonds that also refer to the fact that people that who have the access to those uh, natural resources, in this case uh, the diamonds, that they misuse it, uh, or at least misuse the success uh, to those uh, resources and, well, at the expense of other people. In this case, they, they extort those resources in a bloody way by applying violence, actually. So these are three different fields. Uh, they're, they're more uh, sub uh, causalities, but uh, I think it's really important to draw a uh, differentiation between 
those different three different uh, fields of consequences. What I would like, finally like to uh, uh, stress when we're talking about so-called resource curves. Resource curves or the term curves uh, somehow refers to well, something God-given or ma metaphysical uh, phenomenon and that's actually not what it, what it is. So, uh, for that reason it's more popular term than a real scientific one. Um, because in, in fact those negative consequences are the result of human behavior, human interest, the interests of individuals or certain groups of people. I agree. Um, I think that Terry Carl, a professor of political science at Stanford, um, wrote a book, uh, Paradox of Plenty, so maybe this is the more scientific yeah. Um, term. Yeah, yeah. yeah and um, you mentioned earlier uh, the economic causes. Um, the, the, for example, the, the Dutch disease is a, a concept that explains why uh, when the economy focuses only on the energy sector that the other sectors um, will suffer from this yeah. and there is also uh, inflation and, and, and yeah, uh, this balance in trade, export and import and so on and so forth. Yeah, it's actually one of those uh, theories referring to the second field of causalities uh, a model explaining economic distortions mm -hmm. and grievances. Yeah. And um, the last that you mentioned was um, also the war and, and peace studies. So um, um, I think uh, Terry Carl um, studied this and, and uh, she was quite sure that um, countries with uh, more resources, especially uh, uh, fossil fuels and uh, minerals like diamonds, uh, are more likely to, to get involved in, in civil wars or in international wars. Yeah, yeah. And um, when we think of this, um, what's your opinion on the, for example, I, I, w I want to mention just two examples. Uh, for example, um, the, the Ukrainian conflict on the one hand. Um, Europe, um, as everybody know, uh, is highly uh, dependent on, on Russian uh, natural gas. And uh, there is a pipeline uh, that uh, support this uh, gas. On the other hand, there is uh, the Iraq invasion 2003, uh, where the official statement was that Saddam Hussein has weapons of mass destruction. As we all know now, this was a, a clearly a false statement, a clear propaganda. Um, there was no such thing as, as mass uh, weapons of mass destruction. Uh, Kofi Annan said that this, um, when you think of the UN Charter, this was a, an illegal war. So can we explain such conflicts only through the lens of resource curse, or is it is it more? Is it what what can it not explain? So but, but I would say uh, there's no net, yes and no clear no. Uh, there's all well the resource curse and resource abundance as a source of conflict. That might be one factor in a bigger constellation, in a bigger country constellation. There are certainly different interests um, that, that are responsible for war and the conflict. In some cases, in some countries, um, of course, um, such, such factors, resource abundance, might play a more important factor. Iraq was probably one of those countries, uh, but, but there were also other, other factors, other, other reasons for that war, security interests. Uh, it's not only, only about uh, economic interests or business interests. There's so many other interests and it's, it's really important when, when you go uh, into such a country case to identify uh, different factors uh, and, and then uh, well, try to reconstruct the causality. Uh, the view that resource wars and resource conflicts that they happen so often is also the f due to the fact that it's an easy model and see it yeah. seems to be an easy explanation yeah. Yeah. for many things. Yeah. But I, I would be very careful yeah. with that. Yeah. Also yeah. with Iraq, so there were so many factors yeah. responsible yeah. for yeah. that war. When you spoke of Ukraine today, of course, in Ukraine, particularly in the past, there were politicians uh, extracting, uh, well, the, the rents uh, from um, yeah the, the, the oil transfer uh, gas transfer to uh, to to Europe uh, the, the pipeline goes through Ukraine and of course people in power had access to that or still have access to those rents 
But that's again not the only factor. I think the, as you mentioned, Ukraine, that there are other theories, mm -hmm. uh, and yeah. models explain yeah. those uh, conflicts mm -hmm. in, in a much more accurate way. Yeah. Um, let us dig a little bit deeper. Um, what does the rentier state theory try to explain, and what, how is it related to the first one that we mentioned, the resource curse theory? Well, it's, it's again one of those theories uh, that are um, under the umbrella of the so-called resource curse. It's, it's actually an economic model, or firstly an economic model, or ex economic explanation um, explaining um, economic, socio-economic uh, grievances with the structure of the national economy of resource abandoned states, uh, saying that those states they rely on mostly or uh, yeah mostly rely on, on natural resource incomes on the extraction of oil and gas, so the economy is totally centered on, on those natural resources. Uh, well, then there at the same time you have a political elite in power; they have direct access to those natural resources and the incomes as they have certain positions in the national oil and gas companies. Well, the money direct from the export directly goes through the, to the state and the people in power, they can use the money in the ways they think it's um, appropriate. And uh, well, often they do not act in the general interest, but in, the inter in their particular risk interest. Um, yeah, there are then, starting from that, there are different causalities again explaining why uh, rentier states are uh, often authoritarian states, why they suffer from socio-economic grievances. Yeah, that's, that's one of those uh, theories, but it's probably one of the most uh, solid ones within this wide range of uh, resource curse causalities and theories. Um, so we talked about rentier states. Um, could you mention uh, some examples of rentier states? Uh, in my opinion, a classical example would be Russia um, with the extraction of, of short-term rents um, of the cost of the, of the common people, so to speak. And there are others like um, Azerbaijan, Turkmenistan. And um, what is the characteristic and, and maybe the difference between these countries? What is the difference between a rentier state if it is a rentier state uh, like Russia or Azerbaijan, Turkmenistan? Well, they are definitely rentier states. Um, generally, draw a distinction between uh, different degrees of rentier states depending on the question of how big the percentage of natural resource incomes is in, in the uh, GDP of those countries. Uh, Azerbaijan, Turkmenistan, Russia, we're speaking of the post Soviet rentier yeah. states. They are rentier states of high degrees. And of course, well, basically, they are rentier states, but then, of course, you have to go into the country context because th those countries differ. The political elites differ, the people in power differ, and the way those people, the governments or the people in power, use the natural resource incomes uh, differs. Uh, in Turkmenistan, for example, particularly under Nyazov. Uh, this leader used it for, for personal purposes, but, but also, well, for uh, personal cult, uh, glorifying himself. Uh, so a lot of money went uh, into that, uh, I would say, in a country that's like Russia. A bigger portion is spent for, for the security system and uh, for more solid social programs. Um, so you always have to take into account the different uh, context. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, and um, also the degree of, of democracy. Um, there is a link um, between resource-rich countries and uh, democracy. And, and so, yeah. um, for example, Saudi Arabia is uh, for sure not a democracy. It's a maybe theocracy or dictatorship, depends on, on how you want to categorize it. And um, states like Azerbaijan and Turkmenistan are also not, uh, not in the category democracy. But in Russia, it's a special case. What do you think? Well, 
of course, uh, there, there's a wide range between a fully consolidated democracy on the one hand and a full-blown autocracy or totalitarian system on, on the other hand. And uh, sure, that there are also different uh, indices by different organizations and research institutes uh, uh, putting those countries into uh, well in a position between those two two ranges, and um, country a country such as Russia has shows more uh, democratic um, pieces and, uh, than in a country such as Saudi Arabia, of course. Yeah, there, there's a difference. Um, it is linked to the term um, rentier states, um, but it's a different story. Um, the term neo-patrimonialism, um, it, um, following Max Weber differentiation between the modern and the traditional forms uh, of rule, uh, it is a mixture. Could you explain um, what is neo-patrimonialism and um, um, does it exist in the in the Caucasus region in the Caspian region? Yeah, firstly it does, but let let me explain it. Uh, first of all, uh, it's a mixture. And when you look at um, the, the political system, also the economic systems of those countries, it's a mixture between formal rule, formal rule um, according to the constitution, laws, and regulations. Uh, on, on the one hand, so what, what we call a modern state uh, and a procedure uh, associated with modern states um, on the one hand and on the other hand it's traditional informal rule. People in power bring into power people they know, friends, family, clan members and well they well capture state institutions, formal state institutions and then realize the particularistic interests uh, of well, their people and their community and themselves. So it's all what we call state capture. That's mm -hmm. a particular phenomenon mm -hmm. related to neo patrimonialism. Mm -hmm. Of course, you have that phenomenon mm -hmm. in yeah. all those countries. Yeah. Uh, people in power um, who act, do not act for the general interest, in the general interest, but in, in the very personal interest. Mm -hmm. um, well, at the same time, or well, as a result of that, uh, population of such people, many people are not part of this clientelistic patronage network, they do not see any benefits from that. Mm -hmm. They they even they are excluded from welfare. When we call we talk about the resource abundance of those countries, uh, well they never say or only see a little portion of that wealth in their own pockets or on the bank accounts or on Mm -hmm. yes yeah. okay it's interesting uh, the fact that um, most um, most clientistic networks were former uh, Soviet uh, Soviet politicians uh, big businessmen in the Soviet era so it's an quite interesting uh, fun fact that um, uh, the former um, socialist um, <coughs> Um, that the former socialist um, politicians uh, turned into uh, neoliberal, or maybe, uh, how, how can I say it, um, capitalist um, um, pioneers in, in their country. So it's a quite interesting turn. Mm. Uh, well, they, they, uh, many of them used the, their position, the, they were high ranked in the system, in the political system of the countries, to use the privatization processes according in, in their interest of course and that's the way many but not all of them many of them became rich and how they became business people mm -hmm. so we talked about um, theories and concepts let's jump from the theoretical perspective um, to the empirical findings um, you traveled uh, several times to Azerbaijan and to other states in the Caspian region uh, and you published also a paper on the Caspian rentier states. Um, could you share your experience um, and your knowledge of the Caspian region uh, with our audience? Well, generally, of course, uh, I went there as a researcher. Back then, I wrote, uh, writing my PhD thesis. Of course, when you have some theories in mind and, and you've done a lot of book studies before, it's always something different when you 
get there and then, then you really talk to people there. But on the other hand, it's always not only, I would say, traveling those, to those countries is a kind of a small adventure, uh, uh, of course, but, but then when you have when you, when you have theories in mind, of course, and you start thinking about things are and why they are like that, and that that's, that's a very interesting issue, in fact. So, well, my main experience is what, what I'd like to raise is um, often when I come back and people ask me how things uh, are in those countries and it's happened quite quite uh, often that people say well is it really different than what we experience here in Austria and Europe uh, the press is lying uh, politicians are lying they're betraying us uh, and then I say no and really you have to uh, make a cut there so no it's it's definitely not like this because uh, what I've experienced there is well it's, it's a kind of an adventure that when you come back to Austria, to, to Europe, to European Union, you really, and now I really appreciate more than ever before then that, that I live here and not under uh, also autocratic rule and not in poverty. And yeah, and I think it's, it's really important to tell people and to raise awareness that things are not the same and that how well things are working here, but of course at the same time we have crises, we have problems, challenges to solve, to discuss, but at the very same time we, we really have to be aware that we have to keep our democratic uh, framework, the rule of law, and that people really appreciate that, because when you need to appreciate what you're afraid and the world you're living in, in order to defend it against threats, threats and uh, Authoritarianism, uh, corruption, clientelism, um, particularistic interests against the general interest. This is a threat to our societies, to our economic system and political system. Mm -hmm. um, where do you feel the authoritarian state? Um, well, actually, in those countries, when you want to do research, um, Kind of people you talk to people you want to talk to people in some countries it's possible in other countries it's not possible people are afraid of voicing public criticism um, so you cannot stand up and, and talk about the, the ruler well in some countries it's it, there, there are some rooms for, for criticism for, there's some space for criticism but in other countries not, not at all. There's not even any opposition there anymore, any civil society. So it, again, it depends on, on the country and you really have well, to look at the country conditions as, as well. But yeah, it's always kind of an unpleasant feeling uh, you have and when, when you get back and uh, you get back to our liberal society liberal political climate where we can do an interview like this without any negative consequences sure. or thinking about what might happen in the end true that's we can criticize our government the state true exactly and that's that's really something we have to defend we have to appreciate uh, in order to be to defend it yeah that's one of the main experiences uh, i've made to mm. appreciate uh, the European, the Western way of living, doing business, of carrying out public debates, discussing, accepting people <laughs> who are not like us. So yeah, that's, true. that's really important. And true. I remember uh, once you told us in a seminar about um, about the co-option and not only the repression um, of the system. Um, it was about um, one ruler um, to, to, to clear his image, to, to make him um, publicly be more accepted. Um, he 
I, I don't know if it was a law, but but uh, the milk was free fall or something like this salt or what was it? Mm -hmm. I, I don't. That's, that's quite, quite a popular uh, phenomenon. You have it in different resource abandoned states. So generally, uh, the government has receives a lot of money. Uh, they then redistribute, and well, a lot of this money, most of the money, my channeled into inefficient uh, in inefficient waste but, but uh, a small portion of that money is used uh, in order to buy public support so in some of these countries bread is for free uh, medicine is uh, some, kind, some kind of medicine is for free uh, petrol it's not for free, but, but uh, the, the prices are very low. You also have that in uh, um, states in the Middle East, so not in the, the post-Soviet space. So that um, staple food or uh, products of daily life that do not really cost a lot, um, that they are free or... Uh, and Well, in the end, it's, that it's a kind of symbolic policy and uh, symbolic welfare system. It does not cost very much, but uh, you can use it in order to promote your rule and your pos position as government or, or ruler. So does the general people buy this or they, are they seeing this as a mechanism of, of corruption? Well, it, it always uh, depends. Well, some people think about that critically, uh, others are happy when, when they are supported, at, at least at a minimum level. But, uh, well, uh, I would say that many people, of course, they realize that the overall uh, socio-economic conditions are bad or relatively bad. So it always depends on the country. And, well, but on the other hand, it depends on the wider country context as well. Well, is there any free and open debate or at least to a certain degree a free debate, free press or media, because when people cannot publicly uh, discuss that or think about that, um, they, in the end they are probably less critical. So you always have to take into account the wider political and social, but also historical, cultural context. Because, well, being critical or not, it also depends on the education, education system, the historical roots. So you always have to take into account the wider country context. Mm -hmm. um, there are not um, in in as a as far as I remember, there are no not um, um, there aren't um, sanctions, um, and on the contrary, um, I think there is this European Association Agreement with Georgia um, and other. Um, transnational um, economic agreements and um, and the fact that uh, these economies are a resource rich um, make them more proud of themselves and, and, and more stable. Maybe they are not so uh, dependent on, on the European Union and, and, and on the opinion of the West. So what do you think? Um, does the people try to, to cooperate and, and to, to be connected with the West or but it's about certain countries. Well, Georgia is a resource poor country, in, in fact, and it's, it's mainly about the government and, and their position vis-à-vis uh, -vis the, the European Union or Western actors. But what we can observe is that governments of countries that are rich in natural resources, they uh, are, are much more self-confident for different reasons, two different reasons. Firstly, they do not depend on international support by form of economic programs or systems. IMF, so World IMF, Bank, yeah. World Bank, so they, they gain independence. And, and secondly, well, governments of the Western world, they, well, we, we all need, still need uh, uh, petroleum and natural resources as a basis of our industrial production. And of course, we depend on, on the import of that. So the exporters, as they realize that we and our societies, our economic model depends on that, and then um, they, they become more self-confident and um, yes, that, that's, that's a phenomenon. Mm, it's a shield against criticism, so... Exactly, yes, and 
it's a shield against criticism. On, on the other hand, uh, governments of Western countries might, in the end, be uh, well, might be less likely that they they really criticize those those governments because they they want they need them as partners and they want to keep them as partners. Mm -hmm. I understand. Yeah. So it's difficult to change the environment, um, the, the the environment of these countries and the political system. Yes, um, yes. it's well. In this case, we're talking of uh, external influence, uh, external programs, uh, often uh, associated with conditions, conditionality, and well, this is less likely. Such programs are less likely to work out in the end for this very reason, in fact. Mm -hmm. Let's jump to the to the last question. Um, you're an expert on Eastern Europe, and um, could you tell us something about the the, the, the future? Um, <laughs> I know it's not scientific to make prognosis. Uh, sometimes it is, but um, what do you think um, in the light of Poland, Hungary, and 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 these countries? Uh, does the post-Soviet uh, area? Uh, turn more and more against democracy and, and will be... Is there a time where we can say, okay, things can change? Or well, uh, in Central Eastern European states, um, well, the transition process uh, was uh, more successful in the past. And then talking about Poland, uh, Czech Republic, uh, even Hungary to a certain degree, the, despite of the fact that there's a certain backslide right now. Um, in the post-Soviet space, this transition process was less successful. Well, then, of course, it's, it's always, well, when looking into the future, uh, this, it's, it's always more difficult to make mm -hmm. prognosis. Um, it's always, well, I would say those countries are somehow caught between stability or, and, of the, and, and the, um, the acceptance of constellations as it is right now and change but change on the other hand might mean it does not necessarily mean that they are again going more into the direction of the democracy market economy the rule of law it might also go the other way around uh, to more authoritarianism and the tight grip of the ruling elites uh, on the sectors of the national economy yeah well, and of course, countries are moving in different directions. Yeah. Uh, some countries going this direction, others stay like they are, and uh, others sliding back. But globally, worldwide, we can observe that democracy and the rule of law uh, are become increasingly becoming under pressure. And also in Central and Eastern Europe, of course, we know it from Poland and Hungary. Yeah. And also there is this, uh, the biggest project in human history, the One Ro Road, One Belt initiative um, by the Chinese government. Yeah. So it, it uh, also influences the, the post-Soviet space. Yeah, yeah particularly so, South Caucasus, Central Asia, Russia, yes, that, that's true. So it will be interesting how, how geopolitical the, the things will, will, will um, change in, in, in the future. Indeed, yes. Um, yeah, um, I thank you very much for um, taking the time and talking to our audience and um, it was a pleasure talking about the post-Soviet area and, and spaces and, and about the mechanisms of the resource curse and um, I learned a lot and um, hopefully the audience uh, learned also um, many things and yeah, thank you. Yeah, thank you for the invitation and thanks, thanks a lot for your interest. <laughs>